So I'll make my talk quick. I have 120 <laughs> some slides. Um, if you don't know, uh, my name is Steve Rosted. Uh, I'm the main developer, creator of Ftrace. Um, but before I go and talk about Ftrace and everything, I kind of, kind of talk about this talk. First, I'll say um, I'm, of, um, I'm a Kuhner developer. If you didn't know that, um, usually I work on the real-time. Well, I used to work on the real-time patch until Ftrace became like this, just totally uh, engulfed me. So uh, I originally was a, one of the preempt RT developers, but now I just mostly focus on this and other fun things. Um, a disclaimer: I'm known to talk fast. Uh, I was criticized at, yes, uh, on Monday for talking too fast at the Meta Recipes, uh, but unfortunately I have so much information. So what I'm kind of doing is I'm giving a 120-minute talk in uh, 40 minutes. This is called compressed um, presentation. To decompress it, you need to watch this talk three times. It's being videotaped. So <laughs> after this talk, this is one. You have to watch it again. You'll understand a little more. Then you watch it a third time, and there, you, you uh, totally understand it. So for this time, don't really try to understand everything I'm saying. Just kind of go over it, sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'll try to kind of tell you what to focus on and what not to focus on. Um, my talk may look like this. So um, anyway, let me start. Uh, what is Ftrace? Uh, the previous talk talked about hardening the kernel, keeping it secure, keeping people to see what's going on within the kernel and um, to be able to exploit it. Exploit it. Ftrace does the exact opposite. It uh, actually tries to show you everything that's going on. Um, I'm sure the uh, security people love Ftrace because uh, we're the ones that enable um, executable code to be rewritable. We uh, patch kernel. Uh, the live kernel patching is actually uh, built on top of Ftrace. Um, I've actually, when I first uh, made live kernel patching, I said, um, or not live kernel patching, but first I made the instrument, instrumentation that live kernel patching um, is built on. I said, this is great because there's going to be two groups of people that love this new feature. One is anyone that wants to do live kernel patching, and two, root kits. So first, how do you get um, uh, Ftrace? And I just, every time I see someone take a picture. Wait, no, I gotta do this. Smile. Hmm. There, see? With a real camera. Not this uh, cheating with a selfie that shows you what you're taking a picture of. So, how do you get Ftrace? First of all, how many people have heard of Ftrace? Well, okay, uh, actually I should say, how many people have not heard of Ftrace? Okay, a couple. Um, now they're now like, oh my god, everyone has their hand up. I don't want to put my hand up now. No, uh, it's perfectly fine. It's a kernel thing, and I'm, I'm constantly being told by someone over there that uh, I don't market this well enough, and I've given talks all over the world. I don't know how to market it better. Maybe I'm not talking to the right people. Uh, so it's in uh, something called TraceFS. Uh, it used to be DebugFS, but then we, made, we removed the dependency from DebugFS and we created our own TraceFS. And when you mount DebugFS, which is in, usually you mount it at syskernel debug, there's a directory that's created called tracing. Today, when you, for backwards compatibility, when you mount the DebugFS, you automatically get TraceFS on top of that path. So syskernel debug tracing. But if you don't want to mount DebugFS, because DebugFS could be um, uh, prone for those that are interested in security, uh, DebugFS is probably not the best thing to mount if you're worried about people cracking in your machine. So we try to separate that. And if you have Ftrace enabled, uh, in, there'll be a syskernel tracing directory that you could actually mount, uh, mount that just to trace FS to. And another thing I want to point out is uh, when I first, first wrote Ftrace, um, it was based off of uh, code that was already in the preempt RT kernel as well as code that I used um, throughout my you know, Linux kernel development career from when I was first, did my first kernel, actual real kernel development uh, within my, for my masters in the 90s. And I created a tracing utility and I've used it for throughout when I worked for TimeSys and I even ported my tracing utility to the Zen hypervisor. Um, but <clears throat> that was a predecessor to Ftrace. And um, one of the most important things for me was I didn't want to build a tool on top of like have a user space tool that had to interact with uh, the tool that I wanted uh, to get the information from the, um, uh, from the kernel. So I wanted everything to work with just BusyBox. So as I actually, I was doing a lot of development on um, 
for porting boards. Or, um, I was working, when I worked for TimeSys, I would port their kernel to different architectures. And you know, we had a very limited, we were just lucky to get BusyBox working. That was like, hey, BusyBox works on this. Um, and once we got that, I wanted to be able to see what's in the kernel and how things are broken. So I just wanted to have a creative file that I could read and write from and uh, just echo and use normal ASCII writing. So all you need is basically echo, cat, and that's, you could use ftrace. So, oh, by the way, uh, everything, all the slides, um, I'm assuming is to, to make it shorter, uh, that it's in sys kernel tracing or sys kernel debug tracing. So all the, just you CD'd into that and just assumed you're there already. So if you look at one of the files, it's trace. So if you just, if you actually, if you have your laptop open and your root and you want to see this, you can actually just see, like, you know, mount to, or if you mounted debugfs, which probably is already mounted, which is kind of funny that most distributions have it mounted, and it's kind of like wondering because it's kind of a security issue. Um, Case has to talk about that. But um, if you go into the directory I told you about and just do cat trace, this is basically what you'll see. Uh, pretty simple. Um, and then there's uh, basically available tracers. Uh, when I first did the cat available tracers to see what type of tracing utilities I have within my uh, machine, um, this is all the stuff I came up and I realized, wait a minute, this is my own kernel, I'm testing it. I don't, I don't think this is relevant for you guys. So I then switched over to my Debian kernel and did it and this is what they have, which is kind of interesting that um, they have the MMIO trace, tracer. I'm not, that's actually not part of this talk, but because I don't really even do, deal with that much, but for any of those that want to um, reverse engineer binary drivers, the MMIO trace, tracer is basically that. What it does is it puts in a, um, uh, it makes all the access to the hardware uh, non-writable or non-readable. And when the device actually goes to access it, it takes a page fault. The page fault goes in, jumps to the tracer. The tracer says, oh yeah, this is mapped here. It will write what the driver was trying to write and or trying to read from and then do the work for the driver. So it's kind of a man in the middle attack between the binary driver and the kernel or in the, in the device. So it kind of slips in there. But it's interesting that Debian has that on by default. Um, so the no-op tracer is the way to disable everything. That's the default tracer when you boot up the kernel, and, it just, and if you use any of the tracers, you just echo the name of the tracer into current tracer to, to change what tracer you want. And when you're done, you just echo no-op and it disables everything. But one of the more interesting ones, if you really want to understand the kernel, what the kernel's doing, is the function tracer. Uh, the function tracer lets you see um, all the functions that are running, basically almost, almost all the functions that are running inside the kernel. Um, when you just cat func or echo function and cat trace, uh, you can actually see all the functions that's happening on your machine live. And this is where we have the live kernel patching, or not live kernel patching, but uh, dynamic modification of the kernel code. This is in that small window that case mentioned. Uh, we enable the entire kernel to be rewritable. And then we go through and we patch like all the functions that need to be traced because there's a no op place there. We switch that no op to call into the tracer. And then we switch everything back to uh, read only again. So during that one time, um, it changes the kernel to be, to be able to be cracked. Uh, but that's, it's, that's why I always keep ftrace as a root only uh, utility. More interesting, actually one of the, um, the more beautiful tracers uh, is built on top of the function tracer, is called the function graph tracer. And what this kind of gives you is a more uh, C-like flow. Um, it shows the graph calls in a C type looking at it. So if you look at the example I have where it starts off the do sys call um, 64 and then that calls sys call or sys trace enter, sys call trace enter, which is funny because it's tracing itself. Uh, for, I wonder if I had um, uh, sys, call tra uh, sys call events enabled. Uh, then does a few other things and uh, then your sys reads called. Don't worry about that. He said you watch it again. And these slides are going to be available. Uh, tracing on. Inside the um, uh, the tracing directory, the tracefs directory, is a file called uh, tracing on. Uh, this is a way you could stop tracing. Uh, you could have a, uh, any um, application could open this as long as it has the per uh, permissions being root. Uh, you could open up this file and when you want to disable tracing or stop tracing, you, you just write zero, the ASCII zero into that file and tracing will stop. It doesn't actually stop tracing. So the function tracer is still going on, events or anything, you're, anything you have that's running as for the infrastructure for tracing is still going on. So the overhead is still there. It just makes, it just stops writes to the um, ring buffer. So it's this way, 
uh, you could, if you're trying to debug something and when you detect, hey, there's something weird just happened here, echo zero or write zero into the tracing on uh, file, it stops tracing, and then you go back and look at your, tr look at your trace and see what all, everything happened up to that point. And it doesn't, you won't overflow your buffer. Oops. And I have a typo here. This is supposed to be echo one. <laughs> um, so you echo one to enable, enable it back again. Uh, yeah, I've done that before, this tracing. Um, and of course, then there's the one thing is beware of uh, what I just wrote there. Anyone see the bug? Yes. Yeah, there, you need a space between the zero and the uh, greater than sign. Otherwise, you just wrote um, standard input into tracing on. So bash commands, this is one of the flaws about having like a bash commands doing all this work. Uh, to limit the tracers, as one of the problems of function tracing and function graph tracing is, it's just overwhelming of information. And a lot of times, whatever you do, you're just going to overflow any buffer size you have. You can make like almost a gigabyte buffer and you can overflow it in seconds, not even, or less than a second. Uh, because when you're tracing every single function inside a kernel, you can imagine that's a lot of data. So you want to limit that. So the way you modify these functions or modify these files to limit things is you just echo the name of the function you want to filter. For the set ftrace filter file, and I think I typed, yeah, I had a typo in when I wrote that. Um, you echo, it's not filter, it's, I think that's the fresh, French version of uh, filter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my kernel is, is uh, English, so it's not, that won't work. Um, so if you echo schedule into that file, it will only trace, um, the schedule function. Uh, then you can use glob matching. So if I want everything that starts with Zen, I put you know XEN with a star. Make sure you quote it because you know Bash could play games before it writes to the file and uh, writes everything. And you could do you know everything that starts with like or ends with lock, or has the word mutex in it. Now um, starting with 4.10, they've actually extended the glob matching within the kernel, so a kernel's getting actually a glob in there, where you could do things like put a question mark to represent one character, any character, or put a star in the middle of the word. Before this never, this wouldn't work. Uh, the globs was very, very simple because you don't want to put too much complexity inside the kernel. But as we were going on and we slowly grew in complexity, you know, um, someone else decided to add this functionality because I think they needed it someplace else. And I said, hey, you know, I need a glob functionality Ftrace has ones, let's take that code and extend it for our use. So I'm okay with that because Ftrace became more powerful because now you could put like raw star lock and everything that starts with raw ends with lock can be, you know, you could just filter on that. Now if you want to add more to a file, this is just like bash commands. If you're familiar with working on bash, you need to double greater than sign to uh, concatenate or append to the file. If you just use a greater than sign, you're going to blow away everything that's already in there and write something new. Uh, so if you want to clear the file and just clear, like I just want to clear the trace, you just echo whatever. In fact, actually the echo is optional. You can just put greater than sign set F tra trace filter and um, it'll erase it. To know what functions that you need, there's a file called available filter functions. So you cat that out and you get this huge list of all the functions that you can filter. You can't filter all functions that are in the kernel because uh, there's certain cases, it's, um, ftrace will only trace function that GCC will put a little hook in. And there's certain things that GCC does not put a hook in. And there's places that we uh, deliberately say you can't trace this function. Uh, mainly like internals of the function tracer itself doesn't trace. Some uh, timers you can't trace. And some cr critical conditions like on boot up, there's things where uh, the way the, um, the memory layout is a little different that if you actually try to put a hook in that memory location, things could crash. So um, you can't trace those files, but the, uh, and also anything that, any inline functions, GCC won't trace inline functions. But so you know, so you can't just look at the code to see what you can trace. You actually have to look at the code and then look at this file to see if that's available to be traced. Um, so here's a quick example of using the set ftrace filter. I just echoed schedule in, uh, echo function, and then cat trace and there's all the function, or I could see um, the function schedule being called by what process is calling it, what CPU was on, um, and uh, what function called schedule. Like you'll see like uh, schedule print disable. So the function tracer traces the function and records the parent that called it, which is useful. 
Uh, there's certain other fields you'll see in there about whether or not interrupts are disabled. The need resched flag was set. Need resched flag just means that uh, something happened where um, the, the scheduler needs to be called. So that's why it's set most of the time when you're jumping in there. Um, what that like for what's very important in real time tasks. Usually, if a real time task wakes up and it wants a call, we want to trace. Okay, when was this uh, task wanting to, wanting to schedule in, and when to actually get scheduled in? So the, all your tracing, you could see. Oh, here the need need reschedule flag was set here, and we got to follow that and say, oh, here's when it's scheduled. Why didn't it schedule right away? Because uh, once that flag's set, you really want to call schedule. And usually, you can't if interrupts are disabled or you're doing something else. Uh, set F trace PID. This is interesting. Um, you could, if you just want to trace a single task, um, you just echo in the PID of that task. Now, inside the kernel, uh, all processes and threads are the same. They're just tasks. So when I say a PID, it's really a task ID. So uh, it's not the process ID that you're worried about. If you're using threads, uh, you need the, uh, the the PID of the thread. And it gets interesting with namespaces. I'm not exactly, I haven't played too much with namespaces. So if you have a namespace um, and you're using ftrace, actually I don't believe we tried to allow ftrace to actually work in containers yet. Uh, there's been a lot of people that want ftrace to work in the containers and I'm like, the whole point of a container is kind of to keep it separate from the rest of the kernel and ftrace is your entry into the entire kernel. So I've been arguing that it kind of is counter, uh, you know, counterproductive there to have ftrace available to inside a container. So there's been a fight going on there. Uh, one little trick, if you want to trace an executable from bash, so if you just want to say, okay, I want to trace just this guy, but I don't want to use any utility, I'm on BusyBox or whatever, you could use this little trick with that sh at the, the very last line there, the one's highlighted. Um, echo dollar sour, it's basically, I'm, I'm create, it, it forks a process, and then you're saying, here's my PID for my process, whichever it is, whatever it picks, the, dollar, the double dollar sign will be your PID. Write that into set ftrace PID, echo one to tracing on, if you notice I echoed zero first, although that's kind of, doesn't matter. Uh, and then execute my program. And then when you do that, like here I just, I just ran it real quick and I did it with just exec echo hello. And here you can see only the echo function was traced. So that's a little trick. Now, system call functions. Um, kind of, I, I call this hack mode because um, when you want to look at what a system call is, and I'm for sure most people here uh, uh, understand that the system call is the, the border where you have uh, when the uh, user space <clears throat> jumps into the kernel. Uh, if you watch, uh, you know, if you go to uh, glibc or wherever and you look um, at the code there, uh, when you do a printf, the libraries do a bunch of work, but eventually there's going to be a system call where it asks the kernel to do something. And now this is where, if you want to know what's going on, and this is something that uh, I wish I had when I was learning the kernel, because I want to see what is that next step. What is this black box of the kernel? I could look at the code and I could actually use GDB and whatever and follow through, and then it calls this system call and then it disappears and then comes back. I'm like, well, what's in there? So I need a way to f find where, this in the, where is it in the kernel. If you grep for read, there's a lot of reads, there's a lot of writes. Now, what we usually do is we used to call, all system calls used to be named with SYS underscore, I have a, uh, the name of the system call. Uh, so you could search that in the, search for SYS underscore syscall, or your, like SYS underscore read, and do a search for that, and you'll never find it. And what happens is you'll find something like this macro, this weird macro called sysdefined. We have uh, seven of them, zero to six, of which means that is how many uh, uh, arguments that system call takes. So if you take it, like here, read takes three uh, per arguments, you know, the, um, the file descriptor, the, uh, the buffer, and the size. So it's syscall three. So if you're looking in the kernel, you'll see this. And, um, there's also a little problem due to, um, I guess, to handle um, uh, sign, extension, uh, sign extensions between different architectures and stuff like that, or if you're using 32 -bit, uh, a 32-bit user space with a 64-bit kernel, uh, we had to watch out for sign extensions. So what happens inside this macro uh, to handle that, it creates two, uh, an alias, and, or you'll see a sys underscore, or, SYS lowercase underscore read, 
if you ever look at the uh, KL Sims. And you'll also notice a capital S, little y, capital S underscore read. You're like, what the hell? You get these two, two names for one system call with the same address. And this is kind of confusing, and it confused me for a while until I realized what, it, what, what it's there for. And the reason why I bring this up is because when you write, if you're going to filter on um, ftrace, ftrace picks one of those. And unfortunately, it picks the wrong one. Ideally, it would pick lowercase sys underscore read, but no, for, because the way the linker does it, the capital S is always first. And that's the one that KL sends will return and say, here, you because it takes an address and says, give me, uh, ftrace will ask, at this address, what's the name of the function? And KL sim says, capital S, little y, capital S. So if you write echo little, little you know, sys underscore read uh, into your file, you'll get this invalid um, function. I might write code, I, I plan on just putting a little wrapper there once to say if you put sys, sys and it doesn't find it, it'll try the, I might put in something to make that work, hopefully in the future. So what I did, if you grep with a dash i for sysread and available filter functions, you'll see it's capital S, little y, capital S. So that's if you want to trace a, uh, a system call, you need to know this. So now we're, like, now we want to learn what's happening in the syscall, the read syscall. So I pull up my code and I see this function and I, I'm like, okay, here's the read system call. Let's see what it does. Well, first thing it does, it gets, um, it takes the file descriptor and it's going to give me a, a find a mapping from current. So, you know, everyone knows how file descriptors works. It's just an integer. It's an index into some array within the kernel. And so the first thing the kernel does is give me, go into that index and give me an actual, something like a, a structure, a data descriptor, a true data descriptor that could represent um, this file descriptor. And then, you know, it says, oh, this file descriptor actually exists, so let's do some more work. And um, it, you know, it does the, give me the position of the file, and then it calls this VFS read. And I'm like, okay, let's see what this VFS read is, you know, the virtual file system. So I jump, I search to the code, and I'm like, oh, here's the VFS read. And I start walking down this, and you know, oh, it's doing some protections and verifying that the area, everything's correct, everything's good. And then I'm like, oh, here's another function call that's going to call, it's calls another VFS read, underscore, underscore VFS read, really informative. So I jump there, and I'm like, hmm, there's a VFS read here. Let's go see what this does. And the kernel loves function pointers. It's an object-oriented designed um, language. Uh, it's C, it's not an object-oriented language, but it's the kernel's kind of a little bit in an object-oriented model, where you, know, you basically have classes that are just structures with a bunch of function pointers in it, data and uh, function pointers, which is great it makes it flexible, but when I was learning how to do the kernel, it was god awful. Um, so I see this file fop read. Okay, where do I go now? What do I search for? What do I look for? I'm lost. So I look at what, what's file? File is this struct file pointer. Okay, let's see what this fop is, because right now it's, it's a double layer. I mean, you have it's not just read, it's not file pointing to read, it's actually file pointed to some fop pointing to read. So I go and I search, I find struct file. Hey, and that's, there's this thing called struct file operations with a fop pointer. I'm like, what the hell is this? I'm like, okay, let's go and um, uh, grep for it. <laughs> 2,885 instances of this crap. Usually, okay, if I know if I'm in the XFS file system or EXT3 or whatever, I could actually kind of narrow that down, but still, it's every time I hit a file pointer, I'm like, oh, crap, really? So, this is where the set graph function comes in. I'm like, talk about set graph function. Um, I use this actually, uh, whenever I want to learn a new subsystem of the kernel, I use this today. I mean, not to actual today, but I've used it recently within this year. Um, like, so I'll do this with networking. If there's a driver I plug in, I want to know what's going on in the driver. Um, I'll use this uh, to say, what functions does this call? Let me follow this. So you could modify this file the same way you could modify the set ftrace filter file with all the globs and everything. Um, and you disable it the same way. You write nothing into it. 
And again, like I said, it has the same issues as the uh, other one. With the, you have to be careful with the syscalls, so if you want to do that. So this time I'm going to echo the sysread into setgraph function. And now, if you notice, it will only trace sysread. It traces nothing else. Uh, so when it hits sysread, it'll start tracing. And when it gets out of sysread, it stops tracing. So this way, I can narrow down what's happening. So I can walk down this and look. There's uh, first of the VFS read is, and I noticed down here VFS read, and it called new sync read. I was like, wait a minute. I thought it was the fop read. It didn't even call that function. It did the else statement. So I was going down the wrong path anyway. So I'm like, oh, it's new sync read. Let's see what this does. Well, new sync read goes down and calls call read iter. Call read iter. Oh God. <laughs> You gotta be kidding me. Here we go again. Luckily, with Function Graph Tracer, I can see exactly what it called. And there it is. Access file read iter. So now I can jump to there and say, let me just trace that guy. And I wanna see what that's doing. But then I get all these things that I don't care about. This condition resched, condition resched. Let's just say it starts filling up my trace. And I'm like, darn it, I I'm getting sick of these condition resched in here. I, I, don't, it, I only have so much buffer that. I could trace, and there's this condition resets being called a lot of times, let's turn it off. So I put it into the no trace file, and now I run it again, and I don't have any, I, it, uh, those functions are not traced. And because of the dynamic, uh, the dynamic modification of code, it actually speeds up the trace. So whenever you uh, filter out stuff, those are all no ops. So they're not affecting the, the overhead at all. So if you only trace two or three functions, uh, in fact, I've traced several hundred functions before, ran a bunch of benchmarks, and I couldn't see any issue with, uh, there's no change. So, because the function tracer only takes a few nanoseconds per, um, well, I shouldn't say a few, maybe a few hundred nanoseconds per trace, which is still pretty small. Um, so it really doesn't have much overhead. But when you trace all functions in the kernel, you have quite a bit of overhead, usually about 10 to 15% overhead in the kernel. So, I look at this thing and I'm looking at um, the, the, the file here and I, I see some other stuff uh, being called. And uh, I look at uh, XFS uh, transalloc and let's say I don't want to trace this. I, I don't, okay, I, I don't care about this function. Yeah, it's allocating something. I want to skip over this. I, I don't want to trace this. So first thing, of course, you're going to try is to, you know, you're going to write it into the set of trace, no trace, because you don't want to trace it anymore. Notice, very important, Greater than, greater than, because I still have condition resked in there. I don't want to blow that away, so I, I, want on to, I only want to remove, or I, I want to keep both. I want to keep what's already in there and add something else to my trace. So I echo the XFS trans alloc into that file, and I'm like, okay, let's see what happened. Look, everything that's in blue right there, I, okay, I don't care about this stuff, because this is what, <laughs> it's, it didn't trace the XFS trans alloc, but it trace, still traced everything that, it called, so I want to turn that off too. I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. So, oh, by the way, uh, I just got interrupted. So I'm interrupting this part of my talk to talk a little bit about interrupts. Um, when an interrupt happens, uh, the function graph tracer will tell you, hey, you were interrupted. You see that really, that crazy line right there, the, all those equals and a greater than sign? It said interrupt came in. And you know, right there, you saw the timer jumped in. But we'll come back to that. Back to our normal program. So, like I said, remember to use greater than, greater than, and not uh, uh, just a single greater than if you want to remove something. So, uh, so right here, I'm going to remove just that line I just entered. I, I, so if you see I have both the condition resked and my tra uh, XFS trans alloc in there, I just want to remove the XFS trans alloc. So to do that, you just put, you slap in a not, not you know, the exclamation point saying, okay, not this. You need quotes because Bash really hates or loves to do crazy things if you put a little uh, uh, exclamation point in your, in your line. Uh, so quote it, quote it, echo double greater than into the file, and then it removes it. So this time I use set graph no trace. So there is a set ftrace filter, set ftrace, um, or set function filter, set um, ftrace no trace. So there's a gr set graph filter and a set graph no trace. This means don't trace the function nor anything else that it calls. So when I put that in, um, I got what I wanted. I can now just 
trace and focus on what I'm interested in, and I could ignore some of the other stuff. Trace options is another file that's um, in, or sorry, the options directory is in the tracing, uh, TraceFS directory. And this is how you can modify how ftrace works, or the functionality of all the tracing. Um, <clears throat> there's two ways to modify it. There's actually a trace underscore options file, which I, don't, I seldom use, but that was the first way to modify tracing. And then I'm like, you know, it would be much easier if we had an options directory that listed every uh, uh, option and you could echo one or zero into it to turn them on or turn them off. So the first option I want to talk about is the funk stack trace option. I, I love this. This is one of the things I used a lot. It's to say, at this function, give me a stack dump. So if you want to know, it's like before, the call, this is the opposite of the call graph. So the ftrace call graph show, at this function shows you everything it calls and back. Let's do the opposite. I want to see how did I get there. So at some function, I'm like, wait a minute, who called this? How did this function get called? Big warning in red. This is the lovely thing because this is one of the most dangerous options you could use. You enable this and you don't put a filter on and enable function tracing. Every single function that gets called in the kernel does a stack dump. <laughs> you don't actually lock up the machine. It, actually, if you have a very fast machine, I remember Peter Zilster who had this monster machine, he goes, holy crap, this thing really does kill the performance, doesn't it? It will take any machine and bring it down to the speed of a Commodore 64. <laughs> What's really fun is, when you, when I've done this so many times, I'm like, oh, really? And then I'm like, okay, E, wait for the E to come up. <laughs> C, H, O, and then finally I turn it off, but it would take me about 20 minutes to turn off this feature. <laughs> Sometimes I just say, screw it, just you know, hit, uh, power off the box or unplug it or you know, reset the board. <laughs> That's actually sometimes a lot quicker. So. First thing you do is always set a filter before you do that. Uh, then you enable it. You, echo, or you enable the option. Then you do enable function tracing. Do your stuff that you want to see the track dumps on. Turn off uh, tr uh, recording to the trace. So, if you, so I'm like, OK, I got everything I want. And then turn off that uh, funk stack trace. Always remember to turn that off. Because what happens, this is usually how I get nailed, is I'll enable it for once, have everything filtered, do some work. And then I'll just, oh, turn off function tracing. OK, enable function tracing again. That option's still enabled. And then, boom, my system's down to a halt. So this is my way of doing things. And if I say, OK, let's see who calls. What's, I want to see where schedule is being called, what functions call schedule. So I start off with echo no op, make sure it's, the, the function tracing is disabled, the first thing. Then I set schedule. I cat the file to make sure I didn't make a typo, because that's another thing I've done. I'm like, oh, echo, and not realize like, the return. I'm just like, going through quick. And I didn't actually, I wrote, I did a typo in uh, the schedule that I wrote into the filter file, so nothing actually got filtered. And then when I enabled it, the system went to a halt again, because there was nothing, there was no filter in the function, and all functions were still being traced, so all functions were doing stack dumps. So I always, make, I always double check. Then I enable function, the stack option, echo the function, and um, do the dump. And here you see um, what uh, functions were called. Now, one thing is, by default, you just get the name of the functions and the function stacks, which may not always be enough information. Yes, this function called, but where was it called? So there's more options you could use. You could enable the offset to be printed. So there's a sim-offset file. So if you echo one in that, and then do your, so, uh, cat, by the way, the trace file is uh, something that whenever you read it, it kind of disables tracing, and it's an iterated, uh, iterator that goes through the file. It's not a producer-consumer file, uh, so it doesn't, you don't lose the trace by reading it. Um, so you can read it multiple times. So if you have tracing off, if you read the file multiple times, you'll get the same output multiple times. The trace underscore pipe, which isn't part of this talk, um, if you use that, that's a pr producer-consumer. You read that file, it, er it will erase everything in your um, buffer. That one is for live stream, like if you actually enable, if you want to see what's being traced, use trace pipe, because that would be a producer-consumer uh, uh, protocol. And the big difference is if you cat trace while tracing is going on, while the trace is going on, it stops tracing 
to do the iteration, then enables tracing again. So uh, reading the trace file can actually affect uh, your recording of the trace. Reading trace pipe does not. So I want even more information. Um, I want the full address pointer. Case, I'm sure you love this because it's telling you exactly where the functions are located in the kernel. <laughs> so if you have this randomized, if you randomize your kernel, hey, ftrace is the king of leaks. <laughs> But it's only done for root. <laughs> so if you get root privilege, then you could do all this. <laughs> OK, maybe I'm, I should keep my mouth shut. Um, go on, moving on. The, uh, uh, oh, the cat trace, op, oh, that, I just want to talk briefly about the other way of modifying it. Um, ideally, uh, I use the options directory. But just in case, if you want to see how to use the file, which is pretty much obsolete. I should probably just get rid of it, but I have, I have backward compatibility. I don't want to break tools. I think I have some old tools or scripts that still use this because this was the first way of modifying it. And it doesn't really hurt to keep it. Um, if you, you know, look at what symbol options are there, uh, you just look at the file. If you want to disable an option, you just put the symbol name and put no. Yes, I'm not being really consistent. Maybe I should have put a, the, the uh, uh, exclamation point to be no, but no, I put in no. Um, and then uh, that, uh, that's the original way. It's kind of stupid, but it's what we have. So uh, on my laptop, actually it wasn't even this laptop. It was my other laptop that I did this screenshot on, and I might have actually switched between two different laptops writing this, so um, it may not be totally consistent. But um, I want to see, okay, wh what module is my Wi-Fi on? So I went and I found the, uh, the IWL DVM module, and that's okay. That's um, uh, for the Wi. That does Wi-Fi for my uh, laptop, and I noticed it has that Mac 8211 uh, uh, module, which is the device for my laptop. I'm like, okay, I, I want to just see that. What what does this function do, or what does the device do? I want. I just want. I'm just interested in this device only, because I want to kind of learn it. So I echo colon mod colon. That's a way to say, tell ftrace I'm interested in a module and the module name. So it will actually, it, it, by the way, it, it breaks up functions by um, core, and each module has its own list of functions. So you could tell ftrace just enable all the functions from this module. And that's with the colon mod colon echo into set ftrace filter, and boom. Only the modules for that function was, uh, yeah. Only the functions in that module will be traced. So I do a uh, cat, right, and then here you can see it's just the function. And yes, KL Sims actually produces this. And this is actually, it didn't used to do this, but now it does. So if a function um, has a module attached, or it's, if the function belongs to a module, you'll see the module name popping up next to it on your traces. Another th new, new feature that's, well, relatively new, it's been several years now, um, you could hook a trigger to a function. There's several triggers today. Uh, the three ones that are mostly used, actually two of these actually are used, is you could turn tracing off when a function is hit, you could tra turn tracing on when a function's hit, and you, you could do a stack trace when a function's hit. Um, actually, turning tracing on, I don't think I've used once or twice. I forgot why. Uh, I can't remember why enabling tracing when a function's hit is really as important as disable tracing, because you could just let it run, and it will just keep filling up the buffer, and it's mostly important to know when to turn it off so you don't lose the data you want to see. Usually, a lot of times, there will be a debug path. Like, if I'm, I'm debugging something, and uh, say a crash is about to happen, or just a minor crash, or something didn't go right, there's usually a function that gets called that only happens on the exception path. I find that function say, hey, this function happens in the exception path of this bug. So I'll set a trigger on that to disable tracing at that point. This way I don't have to modify the kernel. I, like, I'm debugging something, I don't want to modify the kernel. A lot of times it's a customer's kernel and I have to like, tell customers, uh, here, do this trace, do these commands. I, I give them a shell script. Just run the shell script on your computer, do your thing, and then send me the trace data back. And when it hits this function, it turns off tracing. So then I get everything up to that point, and I'm like, oh, here's the bug. The stack trace feature is something I've, I'm so glad I added, because remember how dangerous that uh, option of funk stack trace is. 
here's its cousin that's not nearly as dangerous. This is the good boy, you know. He's not the evil twin. Funk stack tracer is the evil twin of this trigger function. And uh, what this does is you can set a trigger. You can say, this, I'm only interested in this one function to get a stack trace on. Just put a trigger on that. So every time that function gets hit, it stack traces it. So, uh, oh, is this what, that's not what I wanted. Ah, yeah, okay, I remember what I'm doing. So let's go back to um, the, mo the function graph tracer. And I'm looking at um, this, I, the first function that gets called in this module is this um, E triple E 80 to 11 RX nappy function. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. Who calls it? I want to see who calls this function. So I echo the trigger to it using the greater than greater than sign because I don't want to blow away my the module filtering. And if I cat it um, or look at that file, you'll see at the very bottom of the line, you'll see the function name with the uh, stack trace. And don't worry about the unlimited thing. That's a feature that shouldn't be used anyway. Um, and then I do a cat trace, run it. And there, it actually, this is actually kind of interesting. It, it kind of shocked me when I actually looked at the, um, uh, what called it. I'm like, wow, this module actually used uh, interrupt threads. It's actually, it's, uh, it must have did a request IRQ threaded. Uh, because this was not an RT kernel that I was running. It was, a, it was my normal kernel. In fact, it might have been, actually, I think it might have been my Debian kernel. I don't think I rebooted back to my custom kernel. And I was like, wow, it's actually doing, you could see right in there, um, if you go backwards all the way up, you'll see the uh, all the way down from the IRQ thread, and that gets called, and it, it does the function, and then it calls a few other things to get and jumps to there. So this way, I go back into the code and see how I, my function was called. And I could do more information digging by using these uh, features to follow the flow of the uh, kernel to say, oh, this is how this works. So one thing you have to... This trigger, the triggers are a little special, and here I'm trying, I'm again being inconsistent. I probably shouldn't have been, but it's too late. I can't really change it. Once you do something, it's use space ABI and can't change things. Um, so when you do something incorrectly, you're kind of screwed and stuck with it. So if you just echo into the file without the double greater thans, like I said, it clears the file. Well, it clears only the filtered functions. It doesn't touch any, the triggers are not touched. I shouldn't have done that. I should have untouched the triggers but uh, I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, to remove a trigger, you actually have to specify it in the quote with the not sign again with the trigger name and pipe it in there, and that's how you get rid of it. Well, back to interrupts. Um, so if, a lot of times you get to see interrupts, and the only, reason actually, the only reason why I'm actually talking about this is let's say you don't care about interrupts. Uh, the func graph IRQs is an option that you could say, uh, you could actually tell the function graph tracer to say, I don't want to trace interrupts. I don't care about them. They just waste data in my uh, uh, trace. I'm, I just want to see a function because interrupts could happen any time. And if you're really just trying to do a flow that doesn't really require um, interacting with a device or a timer or something like that, you just want to see the, the flow of this. Having interrupts come in, because some interrupts can be very big, and that just wastes up your, your precious ring buffer inside the kernel. So I've actually, I've had a lot of people actually ask me for this feature. He's like, like, I don't want, I don't care about the interrupts. I just want to see the data. So yes, there's a funk graphs IRQ. You echo zero in there and it will make them disappear. So when it's enabled, uh, when funk, uh, funk graph IRQs are enabled, you'll see all the timer interrupts and everything else. And you'll see the little uh, uh, sign like that. And um, ex when it exits out, it does that. Another fun thing is the uh, max graph death. This is not an option. This is another file that's it's not in the options directory. It's an actual feature of ftrace. It was added. Uh, it was actually added when we were developing the uh, no hertz full. And I call it, it's basically strace on steroids. Uh, it's a way to say when, um, it tells the function graph tracer only trace the first function that you get and then ignore all the functions until it comes back out again. So I can actually use this to see how does user space get into the kernel. Now it gets weird because when you enable it and when a, a kernel thread runs, it will just trace the first functions that it calls. So you'll see a bunch of functions in there that's by a kernel thread. And you're like, what's this? There's, nothing, there's no user space access to this. That's because it's, a it's inside the kernel and that's still just tracing the first function it calls. But all the user space um, things, you can say, I just want to see how this user space task goes into the kernel and how long it stays into the kernel. 
because that's another thing about the function graph tracer, it does timestamps all the time. So you can see how long it was actually in the kernel and when it came back. So if you're worried about latencies of, um, of your, uh, how long a system call lasts, it actually in the kernel, you could use this. And the first thing you notice, uh, the idle task, um, this get, whenever you have a task context switch, you get that strange you know, idle greater than, or equal equal greater than, uh, xorg file, you'll, that's a context switch within the function graph tracer. The function graph tracer is a little different than all the other tracers. I just love being inconsistent. Um, but then you could see when it switched to the xorg, you could see all the ioctals that ran, and you could see it, how like it took a couple mil, uh, took yeah, it took a couple microseconds each. So let's say I want to just look at echo hello again. So I turn off tracing, I set max graph trace to one, and I, I don't care about anything else but this echo hello, or I don't care about other syscalls that are being done. So I enable function graph tracing, I do my little trick with the shell script, boom, and then I uh, cat trace, and there. I, I can see how it, you know, it starts off, um, it's weird how it does a mutex unlock there, but I think that's uh, coming from, like when it gets enabled, it was already kind of executing. It's, I have to look at exactly the weirdness of that. But then, um, let's see. It does a few uh, do syscall 64, whichever that is, you know. And then you also notice what's really nice that's better than um, strace, you see page faults. So right now, every, it's page faulting in when it's doing the exec, because that's right, it starts off tracing as bash. And then it, as it's doing the exec, um, it does a bunch of page faults the executable in before you, and then nmap stuff. So you actually get to see every interaction between user space and kernel. What's that? Probably. Yeah, oh, there was a 600 microsecond syscall. Yeah, 688, almost, almost 700 microsecond syscall. Probably a yeah, I mean, I could play with it. I don't, I don't know, I, didn't, I just did a, you know, I just was doing an example for the slide. I really didn't care about exec, you know, echo hello. So, but maybe that's something you can look at. Say, why is this? And then you can actually trace that syscall by doing just, give me the full trace of that syscall now. So function tracing is actually still limited. It's great, it's super powerful, but it has some limits, some uh, that you can't do. It does entry and exit. It does the function, the parent. But you don't have exit codes. You don't have parameters. You, you don't know the actual, like what the function's actually doing, except for all you know is what it's calling. Uh, this is where events come in. And events are kind of like print Ks within like static uh, points inside the kernel uh, that were added. Um, on, I just checked my kernel. I just looked at all the trace events, or, or yeah, all the trace events within my kernel for the Debian kernel, and I found 1,530 events that were there with my modules loaded and everything else. Um, they're broken up by systems. So whenever you create a bunch of events, you create a system for it. There's for some for interrupts, scheduling, timer, block, file systems, syscalls, uh, devices, and all these other systems. Uh, you can enable and disable by system, or, um, or you can enable all of them, all trace events in one shot, or you could just do it by system or by individual events. Um, so if you go into your directory, or in that one directory, the tracefs directory, and you do ls events, you get a full directory of all the systems that are there. If I'm interested in the IRQ sub uh, system of events, I look in there and I could see it has IRQ entry, exit, soft IRQs, when the soft IRQs are raised, which is basically uh, when the kernel says, kick off a soft IRQ now, and then that's this raised for it, and then you can see when it executed. In each event, you'll see these files, and the, uh, you can enable it individually like that. So the most sub common subsystems, if you're just playing around with your kernel, that's going to be probably usually the scheduler events, because you can see when tasks are um, scheduled in and out, um, when interrupts happen, what interrupts are being called. You get more information on the interrupts. Uh, timers, what timers are going off, why are they going off? I mean, it gives a lot more information. And you even have ex exceptions for not just a page fault happening, but what faulted. So it gives you information there. And events work with all tracers. And if you just use a no-op tracer, you only see events. So if I just disable all my tracing and I just enable the SCED IRQ timer, this is the, you'll see the events that look like you get the SCED wake up and stuff like that. Um, and now there's a set event PID. So just like there was set ftrace P, or function PID or ftrace PID for just functions, there's events are separate itself. And it, it was added by four in um, the 4.4 kernel. So if you're using an earlier kernel, this doesn't exist. So you get a filter on a specific task. And you can do this, use the same trick again. So if I, if I wanted to see 
what the system calls are. So this is kind of like the S trace um, version of F trace. So I'm like of a single process. Um, you know, you echo, you enable the syscalls. I want to see exceptions. I want to see page faults as well. So I enable that for page faults. I do my little trick with the dollar dollar sign, pass it in, and cat to trace. And here, it's a little bit more information than that, just that um, uh, scheduling of, I can see. I can actually see what system calls are actually being called here. And what's nice, by the way, you could actually run this on top of uh, the max one, um, the function graph tracer of max one, you could do, do them together. So you can actually see the timings of these functions as well. And the syscalls will show you what syscall is actually, more information on what's going on. So I could have debugged that 600, 700 microsecond call better if I had this enabled with that demo. So if you want to trace children of your tasks, so that's great just ch tracing the one, but now say if your, your program that you're tracing forks and you want to trace those as well. Uh, before uh, 4.7, uh, I actually had a tool that actually had to use ptrace to uh, uh, trace when the task forked and then and add to the filter functions all the, all the other children, which is not efficient. The kernel should do that. So there's an event fork option in the options directory um, that was added in 4.7. And later in 4.12, the function fork came. And that, that was, it should have came in 4.8. I, I added the event fork and I put it into the kernel. I'm like, okay, hopefully this, this works well. And um, I'm like, I'll do the, uh, the function fork afterwards. It was written, it was almost, it was all set. I just had a, like one or two minor patches to write to get function fork working. Well, I got distracted to work on something else and completely forgot about function fork. I just thought I did it. And then 4.12, by, or actually 4.11, uh, Namium Kim uh, said, hey, Steve, you, uh, I noticed event uh, fork is there. Don't you want a function fork as well? And it looks like you have all the code there to do it. Here's, here's some, like, four, like, seriously, like, you know, 20 lines of code to enable it. And I went, oh, crap, I forgot about it. I thought it was enabled. So that's why there's a huge jump between the two. So... Anyway, um, it's, here's how it works. Like I said, you start off, you enable the whole thing, and then you do your... Um, here, if you notice, I'm not using the shell script, script this time because I'm going to be tracing children. I just say, okay, I'm going to trace bash. So I, I do echo dollar dollar sign set event uh, PID, and I do echo tracing on or whatever, but if you notice, I had the event fork option enabled. So I highlighted the cases. You now see what echo... Like you see bash calling, and then you can see how echo, and then bash and echo actually running together for a while there. And, oops, okay, I'm trying to speed up now. So here's a few things. By the way, this is a little trick. Uh, um, I'm almost done. Um, almost done, I, it's sort of. Uh, you notice a little trick if I do cat uh, ftrace. If you notice that I said it, anyone see why this happens? So I echo the vet fork. So first, the dollar dollar sign, I said, okay, set, let me see the set ftrace PID. Um, Actually, it should have been um, ftrace fork there. I, I just had a cut and paste area there. But anyway, um, it, the, each time I did this, it was a different number. Anyone know why? Yeah, it's tracing cat. Yeah, it's tracing cat. <laughs> By the way, real quick, introducing trace command. Um, trace command, everything we did today can be done with trace command. And now here's where I'm going to fly through the slides. Again, you watch this on video. So we start off with cat trace. Here's the trace command show. You could do this not from your, you don't have to actually be at the CD directory. You could be, um, you could be in your home directory when you do this now. So everything here is on your, like, your home directory as root. Uh, if cat available filter functions, you could lists. Uh, for function trace, you just say start p function. Um, for function graph, start p function graph. Uh, cat available filters, you just list dash f, and also those things, it actually, is, it will trace for you. Um, for enable function current trailer, here's start this, do a show, so I'm filtering up the scheduler. Uh, remember this little trick here? Okay, it's a little bit different, you can't run this in TraceFS, but you have to do a record, you can't just start it. I might add the fact that you could do tracing later. Um, then you have uh, the sysread here, here's the, the trace command version, uh, condition resched. Uh, here's another thing where you start the, um, the translation, let me, I'm gonna fly through the one that, ah, this one, remember the whole thing with the function, uh, the func stack trace, I just wanna stop real quick on this one. Trace command will actually make sure you have something, it will echo the schedule for you and make sure it actually filters before it enables it. And when it's done, if you actually did the record or if you do a no op or something, it, it always checks to see if that's set and turns it off. So trace command kinda like protects you from that. So doing the symbols, here how you do options, 
uh, more options, uh, the little grep here, and for the modules, do the same thing. Going right through, quick, 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 quick. So like, I'm just basically showing, like I said, you go, this, is, this is what you watch online. And you know, you pause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you have time for questions? I don't know. <laughs> Where's the question over there? Where's the box? Yeah, who wants it? Hey. I played rugby, so. <laughs> uh, so with the Trust CMD, you also have a front end, uh, Kernel Shark. Yes, but and I, did, I was going to show it, but as you see, 121, 122 slides. I didn't quite get around to it. <laughs> um, but you talked to me afterwards. I could do a demo. I don't have time today. OK. Uh, just uh, there is no update on the commit since 2011? Uh, oh, here's, okay, I, I'll make a great segue. Um, as people know, I've changed companies. I work for VMware. I was given a full-time employee to work on Kernel Shark. The first thing they're doing is they're transferring it from uh, GTK to Qt, Qt. So Q Kernel Shark is gonna be written in Qt. It's working on it right now. Uh, they got it almost up to full functionality. And so we have someone working full-time on it now. So yes, it will be, uh, you'll see updates soon. Thank you. Uh, why is your code uh, allowing to uh, enable the func stack uh, trace without any filter? What's that? Why can you enable the func stack trace without filter? Why doesn't it return an error when you enable it? Wait, why does it? Wait, I am confused. Oh wait, why is oh oh well, why wait, why would you do it there? I thought about turning it off, but uh, I, I, it's been one of those things where I, I, it was on my to-do list that's so never actually happened, and it's like one of those things that no one should be doing this anyway. And it's kind of fun just <laughs> letting people do it anyway because <laughs> it doesn't really lock up the system. I've, every even my slow boxes you could eventually get out. It just slows it down tremendously, and it's kind of kind of like a fun thing to do at parties. <laughs> you get, if someone leaves their machine up and with a root window open and I'm around <laughs> they're like what's wrong with my machine that's why I never really fixed that <laughs> what's a ring buffer size how many events can you uh, can you record uh, by default you have uh, one meg or 1.4 meg per um, uh, was a CPU, because mm. uh, the ring buffer is per CPU, but there's a ring buffer size file in there. I didn't show it in here, but you could modify the size to however big you want. And uh, one of my tests before I, I submit to Linus is to uh, bring it up until the system basically says, I have no, mem no more memory, and it will shut it back down. Okay. So I actually have a test case to make sure it doesn't kill the system if you put in too big of a number. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs>